17, indeed. It's been 17 years this fall that I've been uh, involved either as a voice of or an advocate for youth and young adult ministries in Unitarian Universalism. I'm going to tell a story in a little bit about uh, when I was 17. Good theme for this morning. 17 years of having been a youth or young adult and or a religious professional advocate for those voices in our movement. And I am immeasurably proud to mark that time period in part this summer with the introduction of a responsive resolution at General Assembly last Sunday by our UU Youth Caucus. Uh, this resolution was authored in part by UUCA's own uh, Eric Broner, who's a, a youth here and also one of the Youth Caucus leaders at General Assembly. And this resolution was presented a week ago today by youth leaders of color at General Assembly. And it reads in part, quote, we hold ourselves accountable to less witness and more action. And therefore be it finally resolved that the Board of Trustees issue a multi-year report on the board, staff, congregational and denominational responses to Black Lives Matter and particularly examines the year-to-year -year growth in these responses at General Assembly 2017, 2018, and 2019. This is our youth, our youth caucus, our youth leaders holding us as a movement accountable to the action of immediate witness passed last year at General Assembly for Black Lives Matter, holding us accountable to the statements of intent in many UU congregations, including our own, to support Black Lives Matter over the last couple of years. So often we see in our movement, our young folks, our youth and young adults at the forefront of that accountability, uh, advocating for us to, to take action and to not uh, disengage ourselves from dialogue and understanding, but not allow those to be the end all be all of who we are and what we do, but rather to translate that into concrete action in the world. This, uh, this is a particularly poignant weekend to be addressing such a theme in our movement. Elie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, Nobel laureate, Jewish author and activist, passed away yesterday, age 87. And his message to the world captured an ethos central to many young UU activists, many UU activists, period. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Wiesel wrote, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are in danger, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever people are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. And Wiesel was speaking from a Jewish perspective, but became the voice for all who would speak out against oppression in our world, a rallying cry for all who would make that a part of who they are, a part of perhaps their religious and spiritual lives. This idea that we must take a side is gaining traction, we see, in our own UU movement. For example, with the campaign currently known as Standing on the Side of Love, uh, which includes those who are sitting, rolling, walking, being, dancing, in any form on the side of love. 
Uh, for now, we know this is the Standing on the Side of Love movement. I think we will come to know it in a way that is inclusive uh, of all, regarded, regardless of temporarily able-bodied status. But this, what is now known as the Standing on the Side of Love movement, embodies how we are taking sides, taking a side in many instances as a faith movement, acknowledging calls like those of our youth and those of Elie Wiesel to discard neutrality and to be on the side of the victim. This is often a particular emphasis for youth and young adult led movements uh, within Unitarian Universalism, this taking aside. And so when we talk about youth and young adult ministries, you only have to go back a week, although you can also go back decades and centuries, to see that this is the work not only of supporting the young people in our families and in our congregations and in our communities, but of supporting and cultivating the prophetic voices of our movement. I want to take a moment this morning to use uh, my experience as a youth and young adult Unitarian Universalist and uh, someone who's had the privilege to serve as a religious professional in these contexts to speak a little bit logistically about how our congregations can best cultivate and support prophetic youth and young adult ministries. Let me know if this sounds familiar. Let's talk about youth groups for a moment. And uh, perhaps some of you have heard the refrain that uh, our youth group is shrinking. It used to be that we would uh, fill the entire social hall or the entire sanctuary. Or I'd come in on Sunday mornings and people's sleeping bags from the retreat the night before would be strewn all over the floor of the, the church, just everywhere you looked. And now we can barely even get enough folks together to have youth group meet on a Sunday morning. And I've heard that in my home congregation growing up in Waterville, Maine, we would hear about Elizabeth Neighbor, who was an uh, older, older sibling of one of my classmates and how the youth group back when she had been in it was so much bigger and more active. When I was a, an intern in Carlisle, Massachusetts, we would talk about the older siblings of the students who were in the youth group at that time and how much bigger and more active the youth group had been when they were in it. And uh, I heard some similar refrains along those lines coming to UUCA. And in each instance, my efforts for myself and my advice to folks having these sorts of uh, worries has been the same, that we are called in those instances to take a non-anxious approach and be who we are. Those are, are moments when anxiety is high and when it's most difficult to do those things and therefore most important to just be non-anxious and to be the best version of who we are. It's a great opportunity to practice fluidity and dynamism in our programs. In each of those instances, I've found that there were in part structural responses to those youth groups' needs that helped us to move things along and create better uh, setups for the, the folks who were involved. We, uh, we changed around when and how we met in my high school youth group and uh, that allowed us to, to have much deeper conversations and bonding uh, among those of us who came. At my internship congregation, we formed new partnership with other youth groups that allowed us to, to meet the needs of our students and to enhance both of those communities. We've made changes since I've been here to uh, the retreat structure and to the activities and the programs here at UUCA. It is not a, at all uncommon to have almost every year things change up either subtly or in large ways for youth groups. It's a, a sign of health and adaptivity in a congregation to be able to say, hey, this is what served our needs for, for this group. Now we've got new students coming in, new families, and this is what's gonna serve the needs in this youth group. It's an opportunity to be, to be fluid, to demonstrate how we can grow and change and learn 
as a congregation and as a system. There are, there are different resources available to support this work, but most foundationally, and what I've found in doing this work in not just uh, the congregations that I've been directly involved in, but the ones that I've gotten an opportunity to speak in uh, about youth work, is that it all comes back to uh, being able to step back and have a systemic perspective of how we can best serve our youth and our young adults. The, the mantra for this from uh, Reverend Joe Clifford that I try and stick with is take a stand, stay in touch, keep your cool. And if you can do those things when you're working with youth, then uh, Congratulations, and I love your advice. <laughs> Who is in the role of uh, advisor or staff working with youth tends to say uh, a lot less about the health of the group than the overall prioritization of it within the congregational system. Uh, that can be that, that person or those people who are in those roles can be a flashpoint for uh, different opinions or different approaches to doing youth work, but in the end, uh, the determining factor for whether you're gonna have a, a healthy and vibrant youth group is how committed the congregation is financially and programmatically to that youth work. There is a great book, Sustainable Youth Ministry by Mark DeVries that I encourage people to read if you're interested in sort of the specifics and the more nuanced philosophy behind that. But it is, it is the willingness of the congregation to make that something that we invest in in different ways that will determine uh, how effective we are in supporting and sustaining our youth. Let me pivot for a moment to the, uh, the young adult side of youth and young adult ministries. And when I think about the difference between youth and young adult ministry, I think uh, back to uh, myself in 2003, in spring 2003, Jonathan versus fall 2003, Jonathan. Uh, so in April of 2003, I was an overcommitted high school senior. And I remember one Sunday morning in particular, I was working an 8 a.m. to noon shift at Zone 4 Perennials, which is the uh, wholesale uh, flower farm where I worked uh, when I was in high school. And so that meant waking up at 6.30 in the morning, hoping against hope that the temperature was gonna be above freezing so that I wouldn't have to break up the ice in the watering cans before I went into the greenhouse to water the seedlings. So I worked the 8 a.m. to noon shift there and then drove over to Colby College where I was taking an introductory Chinese course and had to work on a video project with a couple of my classmates, Amanda and Ben. So I got over to Colby at 12.30 for our meeting and I ran up to the language department meeting room and about five minutes later, Ben comes in and I said, hey, how are you doing? He says, hey, sorry I'm late. I was over at the bio lab. I was like, no worries. Uh, have you heard from Amanda? He says, yeah, I just got a text from her. Uh, she just woke up, she's taking a shower. She'll be here in about 15 minutes. And I was so angry and jealous. <laughs> and mostly bemused, but I swore to myself up and down and all the way through that I would never be the person who had a hard time waking up on time for a late morning or early afternoon appointment. Smash cut to fall of 2003 and me as a college freshman. I was uh, walking, I remember one morning in October to worship at First Unitarian Providence, going across the, the main green, and they started at 11 o'clock for worship. It was about 11.15, and I was bleary-eyed and dehydrated and, uh, <laughs> and realized in that moment the stark differences in lifestyle between being a youth and being a young adult and how in many ways the young adult lifestyle is incompatible, let us say, with the traditional structures of congregational life. The, 
the schedules and the programs that we prioritize. And so, in some ways, we just have to acknowledge that young adulthood tends to be a time when folks are uh, in, in a period of their life when their lifestyles are, are not 100% uh, in sync with how we tend to schedule and prioritize programs uh, in our congregations. But there are some concrete suggestions that we can also keep in mind to make sure that when our offerings do align with what young adults are looking for and have the, the time and the space for in their lives, we don't miss them. First of all, a suggestion that I heard from multiple folks in researching young adult ministries for a paper in Divinity School was to organize your age-based groups in a congregation not based on specific age ranges, but rather on the decades in which people were born. You can age out of being somebody in that 18 to 35 year old young adult demographic, but you can never age out of having born, been born in the, the 60s or the 70s or the 80s. That's a cohort that will stay with you and, and move along up through the years. We do this well in some ways here at UUCA and uh, I think we can also learn from it in, in growing and in shifting the way that we organize our age-based social groups here going forward. Another suggestion is that we don't welcome or invite folks by saying, we'd love to have more young adults like you. <laughs> we wouldn't say, I hope, oh, we'd love to have more African Americans like you. Similarly, young adults don't want to be welcomed because of this one aspect of their identity. We are all whole people, and our faith calls us to recognize that, but sometimes in the moment, in, social, in the social hall, in coffee hour, we don't maintain our mindfulness of that calling. And so this is a, a reminder and a suggestion to make sure and keep that Keep that aspect of empathy in mind when you're greeting young adults in our community. And finally, for us to be flexible both within and outside of our young adult specific ministries to the needs of that group and of those folks. One of the frustrating things about putting together that report in Divinity School that I mentioned was all the really good suggestions were also things that had happened a few years prior with somebody who was in the group as a leader at that time and then had either moved or transitioned out of young adulthood. And so I couldn't take any of them and say like, oh, if every congregation just did this, they'd have a great young adult ministry because it depends so much on sort of who's there. And so to the extent that our young adult leaders and we as congregational leaders can support those groups to be what they need to be for the folks who are there, then we will be fluid and dynamic and healthy and successful in cultivating and supporting those folks. We will find that when we are able to take a stand, stay in touch, keep our cool, that we can do a lot in these areas. I can attest to both the importance and the efficacy of this method and these priorities because they've influenced my own journey and my own continued participation in the life and work of UU congregations. Particularly that, that aspect of staying in touch. That can get forgotten and that can get set aside, but it is so foundationally crucial, so important. It can lead to the moments of spiritual replenishment that we all need, those moments when you find something you didn't even realize you needed so badly. I've had moments like that as a youth when I did yoga for the first time at a youth retreat and eventually cultivated it as a a decades-long spiritual practice. I've had it much more recently as a young adult hearing uh, a sermon that many of you were present for this summer with, uh, by 
Reverend Eric Martinez Resley talking about finding your voice and thinking about what that means in my life. Without these sorts of experiences in UU congregations and communities, I would not be who I am. These justice-making and community-sustaining ministries are ones that we have to do in authentic and persistent ways. And if we do, then we will be who young adults and youth need us to be just by committing to uh, cultivating and sustaining those efforts in our congregations by being who we are and taking well self-defined stances in non-anxious ways, then when folks who are in their teen and young adult years need us, then we'll be here and we'll be able to be who they need. I firmly believe that the most important thing we can do to serve, not just ourselves, but all of those who are seeking, including youth and young adults, and all of those who will come into our doors, is to take a stand, be who we are, stay in touch, not divide ourselves from each other, and keep our cool. No one can sniff out uh, an inauthentic attempt uh, to, to be someone that you're not quicker than a teen or a young adult, and no one appreciates more than them the ability to actually be who you are and to bring that in a genuine way into your spiritual community. And so I say, let us take risks and take action and let us take them together. I leave us this morning with one final 2009 quote from Elie Wiesel. If I were alone in the world, I would have the right to choose despair, solitude, and self-fulfillment. But I am not alone. Peace, salam, shalom, and may it be so.